So um, I'm going to talk about um, some experiences that I've had with building communities, basically um, two experiments that I accidentally ran over the last few years, uh, mainly because I wasn't intending to run two experiments. No, I didn't think uh, I was an academic of any sort. I was just trying to figure out how to make a living. Uh, but what I've realized in retrospect is that I did end up running two very different approaches to organizing a community, one very top down, one very bottom up, which has led to interesting results. And what I want to do is discuss those results. So I only have about four or five slides, which I basically made in the last half an hour, uh, just to give you a bit of background, and then it's going to be a discussion after that. Okay. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, some background on what I've done. I used to hang out on bulletin boards back in the 90s. Um, got my first understanding of how communities work online um, in the 96 to 98 period. This was when 200 people were online in India, and that was about it. And um, so I was quite lucky to be part of small groups like this, um, who had absolutely nothing in common with each other, apart from the fact that they had some kind of a connection that was not on the internet, that was entirely on phone networks. And uh, from there, I became part of the Mumbai and Bangalore Linux user groups. I used to work in Mumbai Chip Magazine in 99. Um, I put Red Hat 6.0 on the cover of Chip Magazine in August 99. Uh, and a lot of people here discovered Linux to one of these series. Either it was the series that I put out or the series that uh, Atul did just put out in this request. Obviously, Atul did it a lot more regularly than I did. Um, and uh, after a while, I got involved with the Barcamp community. I did the first Barcamp in Bangalore in 2006. And it's now the 14th edition. So it's become a moment that's pretty much taken off by itself. So after doing all of these things, I basically learned a bunch of things about how community events work. And um, I'd say, um, these are all common things, you know. One, uh, project has never worked. Okay. Um, usually it's two reboots. And by the time you've gotten the projector working, your web page is gone. Uh, if you have a speaker trying to use um, a web-based slide show, you know the guy is a rookie. He's never done a conference talk before because he can't load his slides anymore. Um, who's seen this happen? You've never seen someone have trouble loading slides? <laughs> this morning. So, um, mics go off by themselves all day. I have, I'm sure you've heard all kinds of clicks and boops and whatnot coming from the mics since morning. Now, I've seen a conference with 18 parallel tracks. Um, I don't know how to manage it. I have no idea who knows how anything works. Uh, if you're lucky, the talk will actually happen after all the problems with getting the talk going. And uh, if it's up to one hour late, it's alright. It's That's normal. So, now these things I'm sure you identify with as being fairly common with how events work. Yeah. Does that sound alright or does it sound exaggerated? I hope I haven't lost you already. No one's got a comment? Does this sound normal? <laughs> this stuff. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this was basically the thing that got me fairly bugged after so many years of being part of community and how community events work. And I figured, you know, this is going to the point where you got to fix this. You know, you've got to do this right. Because we keep being amateurish because we don't, we take pride in not doing an event professionally because all of us say, hey, we're here for the content and the community. We're not here to, you know, make the trains run on time or make the slides run on time and so forth. So I got fed up enough to say, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to figure out how to run events properly. And so I did that. And one of the things you need to accept when you start doing things like this is normally we think of communities as being a free place for anyone to do what they feel like. Um, but if you want to make an event run on time, you can't do that. If your speaker doesn't show up on time, you give him a shout in. You don't say, it's okay, you can go on half an hour late and we'll just keep the audience waiting. That stuff doesn't work anymore. So this essentially forces you to Think of how you're going to impose order on the community and say, you're going to make sure that the talk starts on time. You're going to make sure you harass the speaker to make sure he shows up on time, test his computer on time, make sure everything runs on time. And this means that it is not an open community anymore. You're imposing order. You're forcing people to do things for the greater good. But you're the tyrant here. You're the one forcing people to do things the way you want them to be done. And so this was something that I had to accept and say, if this is the way to make events work properly, I'm going to do that. 
And basically what you've managed to do in the last four and a half years since I started doing this is um, I've managed to organize more than 30 conferences, hosting more than 10,000 people across these 30 conferences. Um, also managed to get this going as a business so that we have 10 people at least full time all the time earning market rate salaries and created five events that are now well-known brands within this country and those are the five up there. So this has been possible while still running an open source company. So the GitHub website there is where you can find the source code, everything that we have done. It's got 50 plus repositories. It's had over 30 people contributing to something or other over the last few years. Tens of thousands of lines of code. One of the projects that we created, it's called Funnel, and we since renamed it to Talk Funnel because Funnel was confusing some people over what it was funneling. Um, this has also been used by PyCon India. It's been used by Fawcett NATC. It's been used by an IIT Bombay event and so forth. Now, this is a tool for scheduling talks at a conference, for selecting and scheduling talks. Been accepted by the community, used a lot. Uh, if you guys want to see it online, it's at talkfunnel.com. This is what it looks like. Um, right now, you can see a list of events that are coming up that are based on this event. Uh, I mean, that are based, that are coming up right now, and you pick one, you can submit a talk to it, and so forth. So, this is a tool that has essentially been the tool by which we imposed order on the community. We tell the community that if you want to talk at an event, you fill out a submission form right here online, uh, submit it, and anybody can look at what you submitted and tell you whether they like it or not. As an event organizer, I can see these little aeroplane icons that tell me that this guy is not in the city in which the conference is being organized. Therefore, there are logistical issues to deal with if I take the speaker. So, build tools like this as a way to just get things going and so forth. Now, in the process of doing all this, I kept running into one request that I did not think I'd ever be interested in. And uh, there was people asking me this question. So someone says, hey, that was a nice talk. Uh, can you help me find a Python programmer? And say, okay, maybe there's somebody in this group here, but I don't know you guys. It's not like I've seen your resumes. So if you ask me and say, okay, find me a Python programmer, it's like, I'm sorry, but I don't know these people. You know, uh, people don't come to conference and give me resumes and say, help me find a job at the end of this process. So this was something that would keep happening over and over again. Yeah, was there a question up there? Uh, somebody on the phone. No. So uh, this would keep happening, and this was a problem I had absolutely no interest in. And this question of what do I do now, you know, um, it's gotten to the point where I'm being harassed about this. So I figured we had to build one more community tool that takes care of this particular problem. But given that this is a problem where I'm not interested in solving, unlike say with events, I knew I wanted it to work in a certain manner, so we're going to fix that. You know? So we set about creating procedures for imposing order on a community. In this case, it's about saying, please help yourselves, do not bother me. And essentially saying, go away, sort this out for yourself. So we started doing that. Uh, we built a site that people could use to post jobs for themselves. This is also an open source website. I'm sure you've seen this at some point or the other because a lot of people have seen this without realizing that this is the site that they saw last time. So how many of you people haven't seen this before? Is this new for you? Have you guys seen this site before? Not seen the site? Okay. So if you haven't seen the site, go ahead and explore it. It's basically just a bunch of jobs. Um, somebody wants a senior SharePoint developer. This is what they're offering. And basically says, this is the requirements. This is what they want. Uh, if you fit the bill, if you have all of these characteristics, and sounds interesting, then apply for the job. And apply for the job basically means fill out a form, submit it, and you have sent your resume to the employer. It's up to them to decide if they like you or not, they'll respond to you. So this is a site that basically does not take up any of my time on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I simply make sure the site does not crash. It runs by the community, people help themselves, and um, to give you some stats, uh, by doing events, I managed to basically get about 30 conferences organized, helping about 10,000 people over a four and a half year period. Uh, but when you build a site that the community runs by itself, and then you go and see what they've managed to do, 
it gets a lot more interesting. Just take this. It will probably take a while to load because we don't know what the connection is like. Well, so while it's loading, um, this is a site that's now used by this many people in the last uh, 24 hours. So at about between 12 to 1 p.m. today, there have been 206 anonymous users on his website looking at jobs, and this is. Basically, someone who is currently active on the website, and this is a little low compared to what it was here like yesterday. For the last two weeks, you can see that it's on average being used by 3,390 users on a day. That's a slightly higher peak. Two weeks back, it was 3,600 users on a day. So now this is a site that, unlike the previous one, where it was completely about saying I want to impose order on the community, which means that I'm going to look at every single aspect of the operation and push people into doing it the right way. Whether it's about pushing people into getting things done on time, pushing people into making sure that um, coordination happens on time, that things are done well, food is properly cooked, whatever else. On this hand, is something that I don't bother with at all, and yet it works. And in fact, it's used by a lot more people than something that actually takes up so much of my time to do by myself. So, once again, um, if you want to get a bit of stats on how many people are actually using this stuff, I just go to log into the server give you stats on the database directly so you know what's going on. I don't know if you guys can see the number at the bottom of the screen over there. It's a little faint. But basically it says there have been 47,984 users on this website um, since we started requiring logins, which was about two years back. Okay. So, example of a site that works. And what I want to talk about is how is it possible that something that runs by itself can also do better and still work, whereas some other things require you to force the community to behave in certain ways. And this is the part where I want to turn it over and say, let's talk about what your experiences have been with bottom-up self-organizing system versus top-down order-based systems. And which one works for what context for you? Sakesh, I'm going to throw a mic at you. You don't speak up. So, yeah, you've done a bit of community organizing. And um, it'd be nice to have your thoughts on what you have seen work and not work. I haven't seen, uh, you, you have a prescription that you can do that uh, this particular situation takes top down and uh, uh, But the one thing that I've realized is that you, if you have a lot of people invested in achieving an objective that's fairly well defined and understood, Self-organizing communities get things done better, much faster than if you try, uh, even if it's benevolent dictatorship. That doesn't work out. So, over the period of time, what I've come to understand is that if you, if you can define the objective better, you have a better self-organized community. Right. You do have to put in processes for self-organization. Right? That infrastructure is still required. Right? Does anyone else want to take a go at this? So, uh, so yeah, Sanderson actually pointed out a good thing that with self-organizing communities, uh, uh, I mean, they work well uh, better, but well, you've got to put some right names around that. Uh, and you pointed out that um, in the top-down approach, 
we did put some order, but then it's not open anymore. Uh, but I, I sort of like, uh, disagree with that because most of the communities anyway, they try to build bottom up, but then they put somebody at the top to actually manage things and put some order in place at the same time remaining open. Um, and um, comparing communities, like, for example, the Fedora community here, uh, I'm associated with the Python community. So the Python community, and let's say the way Pycons work, uh, versus the way Haskell conferences work, there's still a little different because you know, uh, I haven't seen that much of volunteer-driven work happening with Haskell conferences because still there's not a lot of um, probably it's like a, a much larger conference and no single goal for a community to push behind and probably that's the reason why there's more like focus and more order required from top you know the top down approach as compared to everybody just coming together and then also agreeing to the top down approach or the order that is uh, put by whoever is needed. Uh, but what yet yeah, but in, in general I would I would also say that probably um, you know all communities that organize themselves uh, set their paths but also like somebody uh, you know to have uh, put some order so that there is uh, you know there is uh, people are um, you know in order uh, behaving as they're supposed to be um, making sure that the events actually go down uh, as the way they should go uh, would make sense. This is an interesting point, you know, um, how much of top-down control do you need versus how much of bottom-up? Um, and, uh, yeah, so PJP also, I need a mic volunteer. Can someone pick up one of the mics and pass them around? So it will make it little easier to have a conversation. And guys, please come forward. Uh, I'm not coming all the way back to give you a mic. Great. So I, I'm reminded of an article. I'll try to find it. Uh, which is an interesting analysis of how Wikipedia works, whether it's actually a top-down community or a bottom-up community, because there's actually debate on that. Is it top-down or bottom-up? Um, so I'm going to try finding that article, and PJP, you have a point of view. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the difference between has top... Hello. Yeah. yeah. I think the difference between has job and uh, the consensus is it, it has a bit to do about the personal incentive. In in case of why has job works so well without any intervention is because yeah. No, no. He made a he made a point that has job works without any intervention, and whereas for other conference yeah. for any conference of that matter. You have to be a person to put in some order. And my uh, point I'm trying to make is it has a lot to do with the person incentive. The person who is coming to the conference has an incentive of giving a talk, but not so much it on giving it on time or giving it properly. Right? So, uh, if we could manage to track that incentive part, it might well happen that some people will turn up on time and do something on time. The self governing uh, aspect of it comes from the incentive part. Is it? So, and um, I think incentive is um, a fairly interesting point. So, I'm still searching for the article. Um, anyone else wants to take a go? Yeah. So, I've contributed to uh, a couple of communities by now. And I find that. For instance, the Ubuntu community is organized around organized around what they call as what you, what you define as a member of the community. There's a path to membership, and that is the incentive for you to be organized around uh, the activities of the community. And if I take a different community, for instance, I contribute to Mozilla. Mozilla has a path, but you don't need to follow that path, and it is way more confusing in Mozilla. Unless you have 
the self motivation to drive your contribution is not actually going to work because it does a lot of blocks along the way and all of that. The same kind of blocks are even worse happening in Ubuntu. Yeah. But the thing is, there's a membership and there's this sort of feeling of community that comes with being a member mm-hmm. that it sort of it somehow works. And the other sort of small point is that Mozilla has some oversight. Uh, sorry, Ubuntu has some oversight with the community council, mm-hmm. but it's only got one benevolent dictator who can maybe get his way, but he needs a majority. He has a veto, but he doesn't use it very often. Okay. And then you have the community council driving the leadership to the most extent. Okay, so I think this is something worth going into deeper. You know, Ubuntu versus Mozilla as communities that you and I are familiar with. Um, for the others here, it will probably be Fedora versus Mozilla. What you see working for one community and not working for other communities and so forth. So how many people here are members of at least two communities like this? Okay, um, you guys want to talk about what you see different between the way these communities are managed? So while we're doing that, so this is the article I was trying to look for. It's called The Bottom is Not Enough. Uh, it was published a few years back. I don't see a date on it, but let's see. So one of the things that this article makes, this is a 2008 article, so obviously it's been a while. But Kevin Kelly uh, is the founder of Wired Magazine. Yeah. Wired Magazine so internet edition. He is the guy who basically built one of the first websites that was commercially backed versus just being a hobbyist website. And um, he also was one of the editors of um, the Whole Earth Catalog. That's the magazine that Steve Jobs cited when he said, stay hungry, stay foolish. So Kevin Kelly is essentially Steve Jobs' intellectual mentor. And he's still alive and he's still writing. And in 2008, he made an interesting post saying that um, he does not believe that Wikipedia is a bottom-up, community-driven encyclopedia. He thinks it's in fact top-down. And this is his article explaining why he thinks so. And he essentially says that um, in any community, you will find that there is always a small core group of highly motivated individuals who keep pushing the community forward. And if you do not have this core group, the community as a large mass will not move towards outcomes. Okay? And I thought this was very interesting. That no matter what you're trying to do, if you want to make progress, you're going to have to do this top down. Okay. So interesting point. I think it's useful to just read the article and see if you can find anything in it to agree or not. Um, it's easy to find. It's kk.org slash the technium slash the dash bottom dash ease dash n. Yeah, I'll tweet it and um, I guess it's also not very readable on screen, but yeah, we'll tweet the link so you can have a look at it. So over there. One of you guys had something to say, right? So I was asking you guys about communities. Which communities are you part of? Hi, uh, I'm Lala. So I uh, actually initially... Lala, turn the camera, point it yourself. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I initially started with Ubuntu community because um, I had no idea about anything. So I stumbled, stumbled upon uh, Linux and find out this amazing stuff. And uh, somebody... I went to some PyCon and saw people, you know, laptop is Ubuntu. So I came, came home and directly installed Ubuntu on my desktop and started logging. So <clears throat> what I understood from community, you know, obviously like Sankarshan said, right? The rules are different for different community, but there are common couple of common um, grounds. For example, so if a community is walking towards a goal, how common the goal is, or how many people kind and of is, is there a goal as well? Yeah, is there a goal, and how many people can connect to it? Hmm. Um, second, you need definitely infrastructure for them to grow. If somebody wants to come and contribute, if you do not have a basic infrastructure to kind of make his, I mean, there has to be some way. Maybe it might be difficult or easy depending on the situation but you need a way I mean if he doesn't find his way he will be lost or maybe go somewhere else so you need an infrastructure and if when you put an infrastructure in place you need some people to make sure that the infrastructure works most of the time evolve gradually uh, as the community kind of matures or evolves around it mm-hmm. I mean if I talk about Linux kernel Linus actually is a benevolent dictator and stuff like that but he has his common rules you know he does not change his rules much Hmm. He has this common three or four rules which have been following from the day one till now, and other things is very flexible. I don't care whatever other people does around it, right? So, hmm. uh, so even I mean, I mean, see Fedora where a lot of people 
uh, self driven i've seen centaurs where the couple of people drive drive the whole thing mm-hmm. so it's basically you need a common goal where many people can connect and it can uh, basically derive motivation out of it or walk towards it and you need infrastructure so like we keep it we keep it have a basic infrastructure and let you actually contribute mm-hmm. think about if they do not have infrastructure and expect the community to build an infrastructure i really doubt if you would have been gone to this far hmm. how many people here are active editors of wikipedia and um, yeah so what infrastructure do you use as an editor unlike say someone just reading wikipedia or editing it i mean uh, is there any particular infrastructure that you use as an editor apart from the edit window so is there anything else that helps you with editing uh, it does not i mean if you think contribution is just one part right then they have bots and people who can come and look at your contribution and see if it's a marketing material or you do have, do have enough references hmm. i mean it's actual fact or somebody just made up his a few words and put in wikipedia right hmm. and you have a server which kind of mirrors across multiple globes so people can easily access wikipedia hmm. and uh, stuff like that right so essentially what you're saying is that uh, the critical part is not just the edit window yeah but even knowing what to edit based on other activity happening on this page right including whether a bot has been busy cleaning up this page or you can see a trusted editor who's been plugging this page for something or other so right the infrastructure is the entire discovery process before you get to uh, editing a page i did now the edit. discovery process see like um, how do you know what to contribute to is a yeah. discovery right yeah 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 so there yeah. is systems in place to help you discover exactly exactly and okay. think about the formatting media wiki formatting they have made up made like documentation so i can easily read and kind of contribute yeah. yeah so this is a useful point that if you want a community to take you know ownership of something and contribute to it then you're depending on the community to have an onboarding process that makes it easy for someone to say how do i start contributing to this thing where do i start from and what do i get out of it should be well defined so it can't just be some guy at the top saying i have this vision and everybody else figure out how to achieve a vision that would work essentially that right yeah you can put a common motivation in place and kind of make sure that you kind of follow that the basic rule and then the other rules evolve around make sure that other people can come and contribute okay right. anyone else got a comment we have less than 10 minutes left so um might as well make the most of it so who else has been part of multiple communities what have you noticed is difference between these communities No one else. Uh, I have not been part of multiple communities, but um, I have just um, watching uh, part of Petra. Uh, what I have seen is that um, uh, one doesn't need to be convinced before convinced of the goal before joining community. Hmm. Um, I may like it uh, as as long as I. keep contributing and understand hopefully uh, what i have found is that um, i may get convinced at later point of time but i don't need to be convinced to start with um uh, probably my initial goals are something else mm-hmm. as i start um i haven't given much thought to the community goals as such but uh, it could be some selfish goals also but then as i keep contributing and as i keep starting uh, once it becomes a bigger then it no longer becomes um, uh, as in i personally feel that uh, being convinced of the community goal has to not be a starting point as such i mean it mm-hmm. could be something else but you just start along you start as you keep personal goals yeah you start with personal goals and you see as you keep going along you your personal goals might get inclined uh, so with the goals good. of the community yeah and i think the easy example is say wikipedia you read content first before you edit so obviously you're getting content of wikipedia as personal receivable before you say okay how do i contribute to this content or with mozilla you get firefox as a browser for free to start with and from there you can say okay how do i contribute to mozilla you know the right way to put it is uh, there is some problem that i want to solve for myself okay yeah. if it solves 10 more problems okay good enough but yeah. then it's fine Something and from like there that. you can possibly build up and yeah. go on right so does anyone else have a point of view to offer on this I th- I think it boils down to the same incentive part for uh, which affects your action towards anything. So if you want 100 people to act in certain order, there has to be there some incentive for them to do that. 
Otherwise, we see it every day that people don't always follow which is right or which is in the best interest of everything or everybody. Like it could be like wearing helmet or not honking on their street or just starting a uh, talk on time and properly. It boils down to the incentive aspect of it. Sorry. So, since we are out of time, I think just to briefly summarize, um, there are two ways to organize communities. You can do it either very top down where you say, you think this is disorganized and therefore you'll bring some order to the space and force people into accepting order. Obviously with feedback, so you're not a dictator. Uh, and the second order is to say, you're going to design a system so that everything is done by people entirely by themselves without a leader on top, without someone watching over and saying, we will do things, we will tell you what to do. And what happens in most real world communities is it ends up being a mix of this. Whether you look at Wikipedia or Mozilla or Ubuntu. Ubuntu, for instance, very clearly defined a road saying, every six months there will be a release. And this is important. This is the unviolable goal. You can't not make a release. Now, if you have to make a release, let's figure out how you can organize a community around that goal. And I think that works really well. And I think this is basically why Ubuntu became so successful so quickly. That this was the rallying point for the crowd. Six months, make a release. You can't effort to say, I will do this two years later when I feel like it. So that's worked as an example of saying one top-down goal and some infrastructure to ensure the goal happens and everything else bottom up saying, how do you work towards that goal? Or on Wikipedia, it's the systems of rules that they have. They impose rules on the fact that you must have a neutral point of view, you can't advertise and so forth. These are all very top-down approaches. Somebody in the leadership has decided that this is how Wikipedia is going to be and they will ensure that happens and everything else is entirely done by volunteers saying I'm going to edit and add to it in some way and um, if it violates some top-down rule then somebody is going to come and smack me and say undo the edit and so forth. You know? So it's an interesting system that some top-down, some bottom-up usually works and um, this is one useful thing to say. If you are trying to build a community, you'll have to work out and see how much of this needs to be top-down, how much of it needs to be bottom-up and um, how do you know you are doing it the wrong way or the right way. All right. So does anyone else have anything else to add or this we can say close this and move on to the next talk. All right. I think we are done. So thanks everyone.